let's move on and talk about billing 2.0. What is it? How do you get the most out of your billing systems? How do you make them work in concert with your marketing goals? Bills are important touch points. Alice Harris is here from Dish Networks to tell us a little bit about how billing 2.0 is going to make us all zillionaires, right? Exactly. Yes. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> all right. Okay, so hello, everyone. Um, for those of you that have been here for the last three years, I've been here for the last three years. And I've actually introduced myself with a different company name every year for the last three years. <laughs> First, I'm not going to tell you what those are. I am going to tell you, though, that I retired from my last company in August. I'm now working at DISH. I've worked at DISH for two weeks. So I can't really speak about my old company's information because that would not be appropriate. I don't really, I'm not in billing at DISH, so I don't really know a whole lot about DISH. So when you think about, okay, well then what do I do? I did a little bit of industry research, which we'll get to in a minute. But really what I did to ask for your indulgence this time is I brought prizes. So here's the first prize, and I'm going to award this myself. Um, if someone can name one of the other two companies besides Dish that I worked at before, you get this lovely bicycle bag. So, and I, I will give you a hint, the name of one of them is in the program, which is why you get this lovely bicycle bag, because it's not just who notices something the fastest, it's who actually does the research in the program. So, let's not be shy. Yes? Very good, CenturyLink. I actually was, very good. Let's give him a hand. Very good. I actually was the director of billing services at Quest and worked at Quest and its predecessors. And Quest was acquired, of course, by CenturyLink. I worked there for 32 years. And um, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, I was the director of billing services um, the reason why I'm up here speaking to you about marketing on the bill is at Quest, we were one of the first North American telecom companies that actively pursued personalized marketing on the customer's bill. So what we did was, um, under my watch, my wonderful team, and it really was my team and not me, you know, every once in a while I'd get kind of a good idea, but it was really mostly my team, would, um, we simplified our bill to make it easier for our consumer, and this is the consumer space, to make it easier for our consumer customers to understand it, then using our vast stores of data, um, we were able to use that information to provide personalized marketing on the bill. We had an eight-figure revenue uptick from offers on the bill, and it was, you know, we've talked a lot about data today, it was absolutely verifiable that they came from offers on the bill, because we tracked each offer to a separate 800 number, toll-free number, and um, we were able to actually tie it to the money that we made. So we were very successful in this space. Um, CenturyLink is continuing to go on with that. Uh, when I, before I left, um, the last time I was familiar with those numbers, that was holding. Of course, there are a lot of things that you need to do to make those hold. But let's get back to the contest, because I'm very excited about the second half of my prizes. Um, for those of you that don't know a whole lot about DISH Network, DISH is actually the second largest direct broadcast satellite provider in the U.S. Um, $14 billion in revenue as of December 31st, 2011. 14 million customers. Actually, a little bit more than 14 million customers as of June of this year. It's the parent company of Blockbuster LLC, which is a video, a video um, kind of a Netflix type thing. I suppose I shouldn't say Netflix when I say Blockbuster, but I'm learning that business. Um, we have the largest HD lineup of any provider, 200 plus channels, um, award-winning HD and DVR technology. For those of you that are from the States, you're probably familiar with the Hopper, which is the little kangaroo that we use for our, our television play. Trade on the NASDAQ exchange, recently launched an international IPTV service. So. Um, I know that DISH is probably not really well known here, so I've brought a couple of other little prizes um, that have to do with DISH. And my dear friend and able-bodied assistant over here, Kathy Romano, is um, going to be the prize award winner for that. And this is a very easy contest. 
but I need Kathy's assistance to do it. And so there's, you get really two things. You get the dish prize and you get an introduction to Kathy Romano, and who doesn't want that? She's an amazing person, worked in billing and revenue insurance for a very long time. So I'm going to use two buzzwords today. I'm going to tell you what they are. I'm going to use big data, and I'm going to use cloud. The first time I use big data, the first person to recognize that I did that raises their hand, gets to go over, introduce themselves to Kathy, pick up a dish prize. First time I use cloud, same thing. Intr introduce yourself to Kathy, pick up a prize. So let's get going. I'm just trying to interject a little bit of humor in this afternoon's session, so hopefully it's working. So let's talk a little bit about the history, Billing 1.0. Billing has been, in the telecom space, heavily dependent on the network. The network created the records. They had to be transported throughout network. Well, fulfillment actually created the records. I'm talking mostly about usage records when they say the network creates the records, and it's what we were calling um, UDRs, universal data, detailed records. Um, they have to transport themselves all the way through the network without any hiccups or any kind of you know, bad data coming through. And they need to be transported all the way through the customer's disconnection, and they need to arrive there in a way that billing can understand and can bill them. Well, the problem with that is a lot of things happen from network into the bill, and bad things can happen. It also is a massive collection and reporting effort. It's the original definition of big data. Matthew. Claim your prize. You can wait till the break if you'd like. Um, there were revenue assur assurance activities that are critical to ensuring that we're capturing maximum revenue. Invoice presentation primarily focused on timeliness and ac accuracy. And, and the thing that always I was hamstrung with in the telecom billing space was you, you focused on accuracy, timeliness, completeness. You wanted to make sure you got everything on the bill. But the bad part about that was and we had, we had examples of it, if the customer for some reason had an ordering problem, and it happens with all customers, and they um, did five different orders in one month, not that unusual really, especially today with a very mobile society, and they had four different usage creating products, all of that had to be reflected on the bill and it created a lot of complexity. And then when you put the, the regulatory requirement to show call detail in the states, big regulatory requirement for many, many years. It made the bill really ugly, it made it complex, hard to understand, customers didn't like it. Um, so, so invoice presentation was really just make sure it all gets on the bill. So historically, all of those imperatives have really led us to today's challenge. Old billing systems that are complex and expensive to maintain because they were built to do all those things that you used to have to do, and you still have to do in some instances, and, there was, and that just really creates difficulty in meeting market demands. So there have been some improvements. So I would say the current state of billing 1.0 is we've had seen some simplification of the invoice. And you know, through the use of things like color, big buttons, summarization, no detail. Actually, companies have kind of gotten smart now and said regulatory requirements have eased and you don't have to put detail on the bill. So they've said, hey, if you want your detail, I'd be more than happy to give it to you, but you have to go out and get it electronically or I'm going to charge you to send you paper. So companies are getting a little bit smarter. So really, I think we've seen a lot of simplification. We, to me, one of the biggest stymies in, in simplifying further are regulatory requirements around the bill. Marketing really then has become the value-added communication on a standard service. As I've, I think I've said this probably every year, and I'll say it again, marketing is really the month, the marketing on the bill is your monthly appointment with your customer. So you, you may have a customer that gets their service on day one, never has a problem, doesn't churn, they leave three years later because they move out of your territory. The only time that you get to communicate with that customer is on the monthly invoice, whether, you're, whether it's an electronic invoice, whether you're pushing something to a smart device, or whether you're sending them an old-fashioned paper with the stamp on it. That's your monthly appointment with your customer. You can offer complimentary services using data, and one of the things that we did at Quest on our personalized offering on, on the bill was we, were, we did give customers 
we would look at just a simple example. If a customer ordered a lot of games from us or they were a DirecTV customer, um, we would look at their data, the data that we controlled of the products that we offered to the customer, and we would see that maybe they weren't on our highest speed data service. And what we would do is then push an ad on the data services page of their bill that said, you know, we have a higher speed in your area, give us a call. Got a lot of sales that way. Really just simple stuff. And the great thing that you get from it when you move up to that 2.0 world is your customer then feels, A, that you're smart and that you're using the data in the way that you use the data. And I don't remember who it was that used the phrase last year of digital natives. But kids these days, and actually kids going up into about age 30, haven't known a time when they haven't had computers. And so they are looking at companies that say, I know you should know this about me, but you're not saying that. So, you know, how dumb are you? And here you are trying to present yourself as a technical company that provides enhanced digital and data services, but you can't get your own data together to say that about your customer. Well, when you do that, billing 2.0 personalized service on the bill, you really are telling your customer, hey, I know about you. And that is very much appreciated. And you can also use your new technology to enhance billing and payments. One of the things that I see happening quite a bit in this space is putting apps out on customers' smart devices that allow them to pay their bills without getting a whole lot of information, and Kathy, I'm sure, can speak to that as well, um, that allow them to look at the total amount on the bill. Because the one thing that I found as we move from 1.0 to 2.0 we don't have to provide, regulatorily speaking, we don't have to provide all the detail on the bill. Customers really want to know, if I pay $100 a month, I want to know that it's not $150 this month. I'll take $110, I'm happy with $95, but just tell me it's not $150. So really, you present one number to them, most of the time they're going to be happy with it. And if you push that to a smart device, then they're going to think you're smart too. So those are the recent improvements that we've seen from billing 1.0. So now, because I'm a little bit hamstrung in what I can talk about, I went out and I did um, a look at recent industry analysis. So I went out to the web, you know, the font of all knowledge, and um, just looked at a few companies and transformations and that sort of thing. And I just wanted to share this information with you briefly, because it's something that you might want to take a look at yourself if you're thinking about embarking on a transformational project. Um, one of the things that we did when we put personalized marketing on the Quest bill I did all of that um, data research myself, and with the exception of one or two conferences that I went to that gave me some great transformational um, information and, and user cases on we made these transformations, all of the data that I used to sell the business case to our executive leadership, I got for free off of the internet. So I just kind of applied that to what I was gonna talk about today and have done that for you. Um, I don't have slides, just because I thought I'd give you a break, and plus I was doing price patrol. And I thought that would be more fun. Um, but this will be in the deck, I believe, that comes out to people. And you'll be able to see the sites that I have for this. So the first thing that I was able to find on the internet was a, a 2012 Accenture study. So Accenture went out and interviewed 50 executives from the largest communication service providers. 80% of the companies that they talked to had revenues exceeding $1 billion. So we're talking pretty big companies. When they talked to the CIO, the CEO, the C-level people, um, key billing, the following key billing issues were cited. Bill accuracy was a problem. And the, the C-suite said, hey, new products and services and devices make accurate billing a real challenge. And I think everyone in this room would agree to that. Implementation timeframes are too long. So stop me if this is like new news to anyone. Um, lack of real-time billing. Now, Real-time billing, uh, there are some, some definite uses for real-time billing. I do sometimes think it's a little overrated, and, and I have a tendency to say near real-time. Um, of course, our company was also not heavily into the wireless space, and we relied on our friends at Verizon to handle that, so that could just be my, my uh, naivete in that area. Um, the degree of effort required to integrate billing with other applications these C-level folks in the Accenture study saw as immense, and it is quite immense. I would agree with that completely. And so, you know, bottom line on this, this analysis, what Accenture recommended was convergence, consolidation of billing applications. 
And then there, in that study, they cited some customer work that they had done, of course, that, that had solved everyone's problems. So um, I, would, I would agree. We had 11 billing applications at Quest. And that was down from a high of 22 at one point. And when you have that many, you stop all development if you want to do a huge transformational project. And so that becomes very, very expensive. Um, convergence can kind of help you do away with that. Because if you think about your convergence engine and you have APIs between all of your billing applications, then really what it then becomes is how much do you want to spend and how quickly do you want to do it? And you can unbundle it as you go from there. And so that's, that's the approach that Accenture recommends. My next piece of data was from a telephone blog, a telecom blog, Innovation Observatory. The title on the study was Opportunities in Telco Cloud Billing. I think this one, right? There you go. <laughs> Very good. Ding, ding, ding. Um, the premise is um, telco providers will be trusted providers of cloud technologies or will act as cloud service brokers because telecoms really are the experts in the network space, been providing it for you know, well over 100 years. And so when you get into that new technology, it's really like you're running a little telecom. So you want to know that the person that is enabling that cloud service for you is somebody that you can trust. The key billing issue that's maintained by this analysis was although telcos will be positioned to provide the service, not everyone will be able to bill without investment to enable pass-through billing. And I would maintain that this is the place, pass-through billing, where the regional battle operating companies, BT, um, other companies probably have an edge. And I will say, and I can only speak from the RBOC space because that's my experience, is the reason that we would have an edge in that space is because we've been doing it since the breakup of the bell system. The system was built, I don't know, Kathy, about you, but I know that we still used pieces of that system to do our pass-through billing um, between the various companies. So it was always a regulatory requirement for us to be able to do it, and so we did it fairly well. And because it was a bell system asset that was built prior to divestiture, it was pretty well controlled. Not perfect, but pretty well controlled. So what this analysis, the Innovation Observatory recommends, is outsourcing. This is a for-purchase analysis, just to let you know. It's pretty pricey. If you are looking at something in this space, so Matthew, this is, might be something that you're interested in, they do provide 12 supplier profiles. And as I looked down the profiles that they did of the 12 suppliers in the BSS space, it was really all the name players and then a few that are, are, are maybe a little bit new, a little bit smaller volume, but have some, some pretty compelling strategic advantages. So that's another one. And then the last industry analysis that I looked at was on the Telreptive blog, which is actually a pretty interesting blog. I don't know if anyone's ever, ever looked at it, but um, this one was called Redesigning Telco Assets Billing, written by a person named Martin Ectors, and that was just from April of this year, so pretty new research. Martin's premise is telecom billing and services are too tightly coupled with the network, which is I think we talked a little bit about today. Um, it really creates unnecessary complexity due to that tight integration. Because like I said when I started out, something I think that Kathy talked a little bit about, something that Byrne talked about in his talk was that record has to traverse all the way through and you hope nothing bad happens to it on the way. Um, billing is also integrated at extremely low levels in the network. So what they recommend in the Telreptive blog is moving billing outside of the network and, it, and that will enable new services. Now, of course, they don't go into the details of and exactly how do you do that. Um, that's, you know, a topic for another day, I suppose, or a topic at one of these tables out here. Um, but they recommend moving billing outside of the network, enabling new services. I thought some of the services that they talked about in this analysis were pretty interesting. Um, creating different billable events when you were inside the call. So if you were inside a call with someone and they wanted to push data to you, um, enable a billable event so that you just hit a yes and they charged you for it and sent you a different record. Now, that's kind of a rock your world thought if you're somebody that's been doing billing like I have for a long time and you think about, but I only, I mean, I get multiple records per call, but I throw all of them away except for one because I only need to use one. But now I need to know this one and I need to know this one because I need to do this overall call, but then there's this other data charge. So how do I do that? So, very interesting, though. And if you did decouple the network, you could potentially create something like that. 
call billable direction, direction change. So I may start out calling Susan, paying for that call to Susan, but then Susan and I have agree an agreement somewhere within that event where she says, oh, I'll pay for it now. And so you create a different billable record that that piece goes to Susan and this piece goes to me. A little bit different than call sharing, revenue sharing. Um, Micropayments and subscriptions, I won't really talk about that because I think that's something that people have talked about for a very long, long time. And then ad hoc revenue sharing. So ad hoc revenue sharing that today I'm, it might be this, tomorrow it might be that. Or I might give you on a call from zero to 20 minutes, a date or a data event from zero to 20 minutes, I might give you 10% of the first five minutes worth of revenue and more of a tiered structure. So, so that was actually a really interesting article. They, well, actually, they were all interesting. So to bottom line it, and to try to catch us up just a little bit, are billing 2.0 common options, convergent billing. So, so really billing, I wish I could tell you, in billing 2.0, here's the new thing that you need to do, but I really don't have that, because it's basically the same things that people have been talking about for a long time. Um, convergent billing, so enable new applications that can handle new but bundles, products, and pricing. Drop the expense of massive migration by using one convergence to pull many charges into one invoice. I will ask the question, though, and so if somebody wants to make a comment, um, I do have more questions probably for you, and maybe we can get like a little five-minute dialogue going. Is one invoice a requirement for customers these days? Especially if the bill is available electronically. Do customers even care? And I don't think that I would have ever said that you can't have one invoice until I started hearing from my customers, who are the people that actually talk to our external customers, and they're like, oh, they're so used to getting it. They get it electronically. We allow them to do data analysis now, and this is more in the enterprise space. One invoice doesn't really matter at all anymore. The thing that I think that convergence buys you is you can push customers to the correct system for your cost structure based on their products. But because you have a convergence overlay, they don't ever know about that. So you can optimize your operating expense and your capital expense within that, within that convergent engine. The second option, cloud billing. And I think we've seen some really good presentations on cloud billing today. As Byrne said, though, you really need a different setup given different levels of complexity in your customer base. So it's maybe not one cloud. It may be one cloud provider providing different billing structures within the cloud. And then the last one was outsourcing, and we've seen some outsourcing examples today as well. And those are the two questions that I've actually had for the last two or three years. Does a company really need to do its own billing today? And if you don't think about things like customer information security and, well, the security and controls questions, really, do you need to be the billing expert? Or is it better to rely on a specialist? So more questions than answers, but that's kind of what I have. Questions, comments? Questions for Alice. Just, just, wait, you get a bicycle bag. You don't get to ask questions. <laughs> you can ask questions. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for a great presentation. Um, so convergence, convergent billing. Could you just expand a little bit beyond that? Was it convergent invoicing or convergent billing per se you're looking at in terms of cost takeout? Because there's different ways of cutting the dice in this stuff. That's actually a really good point. And, and the piece that I think most people look at, it's a little bit more than electronic stapling, which is where we were a number of years ago. Um, it's not complete convergence on invoicing. So it's not like you're sending all of the records to one convergent engine and doing anything you want with them. You would probably do some sub-level of rating within each of the native billers, depending on the products that you're talking about and then do discounting in the convergent engine or do volume thresholding in the convergent engine. Anything that you have to do at bill day, you may want to do at the convergent engine. Although, it, it, kind of my philosophy is build all your new, pro if you are going to do the convergent solution, build all your new project products in the convergent solution, bring your old stuff up, depending on how many customers you have and what the growth trajectory is on your old products, you may want to bring them into the convergent engine also. But your flat rated residential service, flat rated business service, who cares if it ever moves? Because those customers are, you know, that those services will go away over time anyway. Good point. Next question. 
It's that this gentleman over question. here. <laughs> Sorry, not a question, more a statement. Um, at Do, we've had convergent billing from day one. So we, we've always had one billing platform and we bill all of our services out of one billing platform. We also bill consumer and enterprise out of exactly the same billing platform. But they are totally different hierarchies, totally different structures, totally different offers. So can be done. Do our customers care? Uh, actually, I would probably even recommend don't go in convergent because really? it confuses the hell out of our customers. We've come up with all sorts of creative offers where marketing just get creative. They want to have all sorts of free units and bundles, cross-product bundles, and customers get confused. And what they do, they call in, they complain, they think they have billing accuracy issues, which are actually perceptions of billing accuracy issues. Oh, okay. So if you can keep it simple, it's, it's kind of nice from a servicing perspective, ease of understanding the bill perspective. On the flip side, it doesn't create the stickiness, which is what convergent billing kicked off in the early days. It was all about how do I make my customer sticky so he doesn't go away. Exactly. But I'm not sure that it does. I'm not sure that it does. But okay. uh, just interesting learnings and observations that we've had being in a convergent state from day one. Good point. Very good. We have one more over here, and then we'll have to wrap up. So back in my days when I used to be with Convergis, we're talking eight, nine years ago, Convergence was the big sell at that point in time. And yes. to some extent, it never made any sense to me because mm -hmm. although you may be consolidating from a plat platform point of view at the front end, uh, you get one single dispute on a bill. If you haven't got the ability to do conditional kind of payment allocation, you're holding up your, your, your cash flow process throughout the whole, the whole cycle. It, it didn't technically make any sense to me at the time. But looking at it now, it, it seems to service more the internal operator than the actual customer. Uh, I don't care whether I get 10, 20 bills, in all honesty. Most of it's automated. Payments have gone out of uh, my bank account before. I, my, I even probably look at the bill, in all honesty. Uh, oh, yeah. Because it's wallet shock, really. I, because honestly, if you have three separate bills, you're on three separate payment timelines, and you don't have to pay triple the amount of money once a month. And some people prefer that. I don't know whether it stemmed from, it was service differentiated. So as a new service came online, typically you had a new rating and billing platform because the old system was legacy and you couldn't handle the new service that you were bringing on. And it moved that way for a while, then it came back to convergence from a, a localized operator point of view. There's no benefit to the consumer, I don't think. Right. right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'll have to cut it off at this point, but we can certainly take this up again at the coffee break. Alice Harris, thank you so very much. Thank you. And good luck to you at DISH. Thank you.